Hi, I'm Tom Long. Tomorrow, as I'm recording this, tomorrow is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. And I wanted to record uh, this message today because the reading for this Sunday in the Gospel of Mark is um, has been the source of a lot of hurt within the church, within people associated with those of us who identify with the church. Um, it's been used as the basis for being very judgmental, very hurtful, very lacking in empathy, very lacking in sympathy. And I think most uh, pastors recognize that this is a challenging passage. Um, and I'm also thinking that you probably hear when you read these words, if you haven't done the deep dive into what the Bible says on the topic of marriage and divorce, you probably hear something very different than what was actually the purpose of the words that Jesus had to say. And I myself have been divorced. I know that there's a lot of pain associated with being divorced. And if there's some way that I can uh, unpack what the Bible is saying here so that it could be helpful to those that have gone through or are going through or are about to go through the heartache and the challenges of what I went through, then, I, then I'd like to provide that for you. So today's topic, God help us all, is marriage and divorce. Imagine, if you will, for just a minute, that you're a, an army scout and you've gone behind enemy lines and in the course of going behind enemy lines, you've been captured. And the group that has captured you is an artillery battalion for the enemy. And they begin to interrogate you, perhaps even to torture you, asking you, where is your company located? They want to get the information so that they can aim their artillery at your team. And in response to them, you come up with some coordinates that are close, but not close enough that they would actually kill the people that you came with, but close enough to be believable. So you give them these fake coordinates. So here's my question. Did you commit a sin? You see, the ninth commandment is that you don't tell a lie. But you just told a lie. So what could you have done not to commit a sin? If you gave them the coordinates and they fired on those coordinates and your team was killed, well, wait a minute, wouldn't you be guilty then of the sixth commandment? Not to kill. Sometimes in life, we come up on these hard places where we don't have a choice between good and evil. We're left only with a choice of the lesser of two evils. Now, the world hasn't always been that way. Before the fall, before Adam and Eve decided to eat the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, before that happened, everything was good. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, God declares the light and the darkness to be good, the water and the dry land to be good, the vegetation to be good, the heavenly bodies to be good, the birds and the fish to be good, the wild animals to be good. All of creation, he finally, you know, <laughs> there's a crescendo and at the end in Genesis 1:31, God says, all of creation is good. So the way the world was created to be, was meant to be, was to be good. 
Now we come to verse 18 of the second chapter of Genesis. The Lord God said, it is not good for, man, for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, what's the first thing that's not good in creation? It's being alone. It's not having a community. And I think a lot of us have felt the weight of being alone during this pandemic when we've been forced to uh, quarantine or stay inside, or there's even a sense of isolation that comes just from out of love wearing a mask to protect other people. Because you don't see the, the, their, the expression on their face. You don't have that connection that you have in a face-to-face -face communication. So we've experienced a lot of what it is to be alone. But most of us, I mean, let's, let's be real, most of us at some point in our lives have felt alone. And when God saw that Adam was alone, he said, mm, nah, not good. And this word alone comes from, and the Hebrew word, labados, comes from the concept of being separate, apart from. And so there's that sense of being disconnected from community when we're on our own. So what we're looking at in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis 1 is kind of a, a story of, it's kind of a, a literary form that goes over how God created the world. And then in Genesis chapter 2, the, the literary form changes to a narrative form. And so what's going on here is now uh, we're getting an explanation for why humans are created as a man and a woman. So this is more than the story of uh, how marriage began. It's the story of how community began. Because the whole point here is, it's not good for an individual to be alone and out of community. Now, community can be a lot of things. You know, you can be born into a community. You can marry into a community. Um, I, I love the, the toast in one of the Hallmark movies that we watch, where at the end, uh, the one of the authors that this um, lady is an editor for, one of the authors proposes a toast and he says to family who can be friends and friends who can be family. And uh, I've been blessed in my life to uh, enjoy both kinds of community. Um, when I'm away from my uh, blood relations, uh, I have had the opportunity to have an extended family. I enjoy that here in North Carolina. I enjoyed that in uh, California. In Hawaii, uh, people may take in other kids that maybe uh, don't have the opportunities that the family can offer them, or they, they may be just connected out of uh, friendship. And those family units are called ohana. And it's not really related to being married or not married. It's, it's, um, it's just a family-like community. The, that these folks have together. So God is not is looking at Adam and saying, ah, it's not good that this guy is by himself. So we're going to create community. And so now it continues in verse in, in Genesis 2, verse 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And now notice he's looking for a suitable helper. And we're going to talk about what that means. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. Now, 
The word helper here is one of those words. I was talking about how the, these passages have been abused so often. And so um, this word helper is one of those words that gets abused. It's saying that, look, the wife is like a servant to the man because she's the helper. You know, she's, she's like the help, right? Oh, guess what? The word helper here, you know who, who is described as the helper most often in the Bible? I mean, way dominantly the most often. The helper? Oh, it's God. God is the one that provides what we lack, and he's described as the helper. Ah, so maybe it doesn't mean what those people have been, you know, those misogynists, those male supremacists. Maybe it doesn't mean what they've been claiming after all. Food for thought, right? And then that word that's translated suitable in the New International Version. Um, Konegdo, if you know Hebrew, I apologize if I'm pronouncing these things incorrectly. Uh, that means in front of or in a corresponding position to. And it was used, for example, to describe choirs uh, where one side would sing out one part and then the other side would sing out the, the other part in response. So you would have this um, kind of responsive back and forth. Uh, and, and so there's this correspondence that's supposed to go on this suitable helper is, is one who corresponds to, is equal to, is also you're, you're receiving help and you're giving help. That's what was intended in this story. So, wow, talk about a passage that has been taken completely out of its original meaning and made to mean something it never did. So now we come down to uh, verse, verse uh, 23. And, and I want to make a little point here. As you go through chapter 2, up until verse 23, if you're reading a modern translation, it most likely says the man did this, a man did that, God said to the man this. Well, the word that is translated man all of those times is the word ha'adam, Adam. It's not man. Okay, we haven't heard the word man until we get to verse 23. So the man said, that's a, and their man, again, that first man is Adam. Then we get to, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. And there the Hebrew word is Isa, for she was taken out of man. And there, for the very first time, ta-da, we have the word ish, man. So Adam now becomes a man, and Eve becomes a woman. So the part of Adam that was left out, <laughs> uh, left behind, and the, and the part of Adam that was taken out, one part becomes a man, one part becomes a woman. I mean, I don't know, was this the first gender assignment operation performed by God? Food to think? Food for thought, isn't it? Now in Genesis 127, it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. So it doesn't matter which part of Adam, Ish or Isa, that you're talking about, very explicitly, the Bible says God created them in his image. There's no up here, down here, over there, around here. There is no us and the other. There is equality. There is correspondence, complementariness. There is helpfulness meeting of needs. And then in verse 24 says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. So the, the, 
the Hebrew is not very explicit about what, you know, sometimes it's translated rib, sometimes side. There's a piece that comes out and a piece that remains, and then they're fused together again, and they become one flesh. When that happens, it's like a, a reunion of the, of the two parts. And if you are so blessed as to find a, a soulmate, that's what you're going to feel like when the two of you come together. You're going to feel like there's the part I've been missing and now I am whole. Now we are whole. We are, we are one whole uh, unit. And this word um, that's uh, translated united to his wife, uh, sometimes translated cling or cleave, uh, and it means to be together in close proximity. And sometimes it's used with being physically proximate. And other times it just means close, you know, emotionally uh, close with regard to affection. Now let's loop back to the problem of the, that this pairing was intended to solve. It's not good for a person to be alone. The problem is human isolation. The pairing of Adam and Eve is the prototype for what will become society. It is the solution to isolation, and it needs to be seen that way. But it doesn't mean that this beginning point is all there is to community. Community can express itself in so many different ways, and it does in so many different cultures. It's even evolved in the way it expresses itself in American culture. I live in the United States, and historically, um, up, up through the 1930s, uh, we were multi-generational. You had grandparents, parents, and children all living in the same house. And now it tends to be uh, just two generations. And the kids can't wait to get out of there. You know? So it's a very different thing, but it's still a uh, family, it's still community. And then some families bring in others and provide them with friendship and fellowship and support and love. So there's a lot of different ways to have community. The church is a form of community. Uh, your clubs, your athletic teams, there's a lot of ways to experience community in this world. And that those are good things. We're not saying they're not good. What's not good is cutting yourself off from other people. That's not healthy. That's not what the plan was to begin with. So does that mean that uh, it's not good to be single? Again, this is one of the ways that the understanding of this passage has been abused because it's not saying uh, that it's bad to be single. In fact, if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 8, Paul indicates that if you can keep your pants on, it's probably preferable to remain single so that uh, you can give your full heart to the ministry of the Lord. So, you know, let, let, let's, not, let's not push things to say, th say what they're not saying. And sometimes another area where, where you will hear this passage used is uh, to say that the only way that you can have community is heterosexual coupling. And we've just mentioned there's a ton of other kinds of community. They don't have any issue with that, you know, <laughs> because uh, it, it doesn't, there's no misalignment with their preconceived notions. But I think the, one of the problems with that is, first of all, it overlooks the gender neutrality of pre-operation Adam. Up until chapter 2, verse 23, Adam had no gender. He was just Adam. Now, if you disagree with that, if you, if you say, well, it's just, it just happened that they didn't call him a man until verse uh, 23, then there's another issue. The issue is, what was Eve made out of? Oh, whoop, she was made out of man parts. So don't go crazy here trying to say, oh, this was a man, this was a woman, that's the only way to do it. Um, I think you're pushing the passage 
you're abusing the passage. You, you're pushing it to, to match your own preconce preconceptions. And uh, I think you need to keep a little bit more of an open mind, okay? That's all, that's all I'm saying. And if you're transgender or you're in a homosexual uh, relationship or you're single, I don't want you to feel like God creating Adam and Eve was in some way a slight to you. It is telling you that what God wants for you is not to be isolated, not to be separated, not to be alone. If you can't find a church that can love you the way you are, you need to find a different church. If that's not the, if that's not the church that your parents go to or your friends go to, find a different one. There are people out there that will encourage you in your faith walk, who will love you exactly the way God made you. All right, the New Testament passage, the gospel reading for this week is Mark chapter 10, verses two through 16. So if you thought the Genesis two was kind of touchy, wait till you get into, wait till you get into this gospel reading. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. You ready? Here we go. 